Well, we are right in the middle of our series called Now and Forever. Like I said, we're getting pictures into heaven, getting little glimpses of what it looks like, but uh, realizing that it has massive implications for right now and how we are, can impact eternity today through how we, we live. And so uh, I don't know about you, I've, this has been an equally challenging series as well as just fun and exciting and inspiring to recognize that you have purpose uh, today that we need to live with a little bit of healthy urgency. There's been a, re- a good reminder in this series, like, hey, uh, we, we need to have that healthy urgency. There is purpose, and we can move, move forward. Uh, we, we've talked about some, some myths or some, just some, some things that we believe about heaven, that our culture uh, and, and society will also um, just kind of to bring up. And, and one of them, and we kind of bring it up every week, is like, heaven's boring. Right, like it's like some eternal worship service or something like that, and we kind of have it in our mind that I might get bored in heaven, or I don't know what I'm going to do. We'll talk a little bit about that today. All right, I think that's a lie, and we've been just trying to dispel that lie and and and, and speak truth over that. Also, our culture, if you think about it, hell, heaven's boring. Hell's a party, and so we've talked about bringing a little bit of context to that and truth into that. And then we talked about last week that you've got time. We, b- we believe the lie that we've got time. Well, you've got time, but as we've been seeing, maybe not as much time as you think. And so uh, we talked about, uh, the b- Scripture said it was like a mist. Our time here compared to eternity was like, was like a mist. Uh, another way to look at it would be like this. If I can do this without, there we go. Your life is a, a light that shines bright for a few moments. And then eventually, this thing is going to hopefully not burn my finger. <laughs> you get the picture. And then it's done. And we've talked about the fact that there's no redos. If you watched any college football last night, you know, Notre, Notre Dame, if, if you don't know, they lost on the last second to Ohio State Buckeyes. Ohio State scored a touchdown, which is like one second to go, game over. And I saw somewhere on there that it looked like on the last two plays from the goal line, Notre Dame only had 10 players on the field. They were minus one. They could have had 11 players, but for some reason, with all the stuff, they only had 10. I didn't hear anybody this morning say, you know what, I think if we would have had 11, we, we could have maybe done better um, on the field, so let's, let's get everybody back together, and, and let's, let's get the 11th man on the field, and let's run that fourth down play again at the last second. Let's do that again. Let's do another redo. No, everybody knew the terms of the deal. We may not have liked the outcome, but everyone came in knowing, nope, the box score, once the box score is written, there are no more alterations. And we have learned with, with a little bit of humility that when we talk about your eternity, your eternity, when it comes to that moment and you stand before your Creator, which is the pinnacle moment, everything is building up to that there will be no more alterations to the box score. So what you do now matters. When you have that that short span of of a light to shine, we have found out that it has significance. You can be a player in eternity right now. That's why I believe this series, if you haven't listened, go back two weeks because this is only week three. But this is, to me, has been one of the most significant series that we've done at Freedom Church because it has put a lot of things into perspective. And so today, I'm going to steal a message from a pastor named Louis Giglio. I heard this in in the spring. Uh, His was seven things you can't do in heaven. I've got it at six. And I'm just going to... I'm just going to steal from him today because I was like, I, 
this message to me really struck home for me. And as we were planning this series, I was like, I have no shame. Like this, this hits a lot of the things I want to talk about in the series. And so I don't always do that, but today I'm like, I'm going to do that. And I think you'll be inspired. So I want to talk about seven things that actually do take place in heaven. And then we'll transition to some things that you can't do in heaven. And so the question is kind of what is heaven like? I want to go through seven things real fast on what it's like. I mean, a lot of us, again, if, we, if I were to go to ask just the random person on the street, what's heaven like? And we're going to come up with some sort of maybe joke where we meet Peter at the pearly gates and he wants to know why he should let you in, or I'm going to go meet the big guy upstairs, or it's just this state of mind, the, you know, the great by and by. And this is not the picture that we get from scripture anyway. And let me just back, let me put a pause because this hit me this morning. I don't know about you, but as we've been journeying through the series, at least for me, I look at some of this stuff and I'm like, this is crazy. Like, it sounds like a, a, this wild place, heaven and eternity. You got these animals and beasts that it describes with wings and eyes, and it's just like, what are they hallucinating on, right? So, why would I give any credit to Scripture when it has to talk about these things that just seem so outlandish? I've had, to, I've had to come to grips with, I don't understand it, sounds crazy, but why am I saying, yeah, I believe it? It comes down to this guy named Jesus, which is why we are here. Jesus, he, he's a historical guy. Like people know, he lived and walked and breathed on this earth. And if you, if you go through ancient documents and archaeology and everything, they're like, he lived. And then we have eyewitness testimonies, four of them, of people writing in the time of where other eyewitnesses were there that could say, nope, that didn't happen, or yep, it did. And if you read the Gospels all the time, they're name-dropping people. Why do you know so many names from the New Testament? I believe they're name dropping. You go ask Malchus why Peter chopped his ear off. Malchus has no business writing, being in there, whether than hey, go to go to his home. He's right there. He could tell you he had it happen to him. I, there's so much evidence to show that not only Jesus lived, but we have actual eyewitness testimonies of what he said, what he did, the miracles. But he didn't just heal people and teach good things. He went beyond that. He said, I am God. That's why he died. That's why they arrested him. When he started claiming, I'm God, the religious people lost their mind, arrested him, and had him crucified. And then all those eyewitnesses saw him die. And then they saw him alive again. All right. So the guy who defeated death the guy who claimed to be God, claimed to be the Savior of the world, said a lot of things about eternity. I'm going to roll with that guy. Any other religion? I can go to their grave site today. The guy who defeated death said, I have a lot to say about the other side of this thing, and there's a lot of hope. There's a, there's a lot that matters. There's a lot at stake. I'm banking on Jesus everything I have. So as crazy as it sounds, all right, I, I think, hey, it's okay to, to be a Christian and be like, you know what, this sounds crazy. I, I'll show you here in a second. Here, here. First one, heaven is real. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So I'm already trying to do a task to explain something that is unexplainable that I can't. I haven't been there. I don't know. I didn't have any near-death experiences. I can't come back and tell you anything like that. All right, but I'm going to do my best to lean on here's what Jesus said or here's what one of his eyewitness followers said in Revelation, okay? So we're going to get a taste of it. I remember um, this was a few years ago. My boys, I love as they're growing up, and you can see their minds kind of expanding as they're learning and growing in education, but also when it comes to spiritual matters, like, eternity and different things like that. And we were driving in the car one day and they're like, dad, 
Where's, where's, where's heaven? Like, do you drive there? Do you, do you fly there? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, ah. And, and my, my Otis at the time, he's, he's like, Dad, you're the pastor. Don't you know these things? I'm like, that's, you know. And so I'm like, well, it's kind of, in, it's in the Bible, but it's not a place that you can go to. It's not a physical place that we can drive to. And he's like, well, where is it? I'm like, well, the Bible, it, up? I don't know. <laughs> like, you go up, and he's like, well, how long does it take to get there? Like, do you get a rocket ship or something like that? Like, like, oh my gosh, I, don't, I am the pastor and I don't know these answers, right? I'm just fumbling big time. Eventually, I'm like, okay, listen, it's a place that you can go to, but quite honestly, like, it doesn't happen until you die. And then, if you know Jesus, if he's your friend, if, he, if you said he's the boss of your life, the Bible just says, yeah, you get to go to heaven. To which I hear my son say, Dad, yeah, son. I want to die right now. <laughs> to which I'm like, I, I think I'm really screwing this up, traumatizing my kid on this drive, all right? It is a real place, but you can't get there physically, at least not right now. Second thing in heaven is upgrades, all right? I don't know if Oprah's going to be there. If she has a relationship with Jesus, she will, but it's like, you get an upgrade, you get an upgrade, you get an upgrade. Everybody is getting upgrades. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. 1 Corinthians 15 has a lot of the verses. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do a lot of teaching today. I'm going to walk through a lot of verses and things. This would be a great sermon to take some notes, all right? Um, the, the stats say you got an 80% chance of going, higher chance of going to heaven if you take notes in the sermon. So I'm just saying, just saying, I'm, I'm kidding. That's not in there. But anyway, uh, no allergies in heaven, okay? No, no migraines, you're getting an upgrade. I'm going to have hair, all right? Some of you guys, I don't know if you're going to have a celestial tan when, you, when you're in heaven. I just, we're going to, the Bible speaks to the fact that our weak and broken in bodies that are aching and in pain, um, they are not going to be there forever. Third thing is heaven is tangible. Now, I, don't, I can't speak specifically to all of these things, but they're all, it seems to indicate that there are things that we can touch, like food. Okay, The Bible, and I know for some of us we could argue about, hey, is this symbolism or is this real? I, again, I can't def- tell you definitively, but the Bible talks about these feasts and banquets that, that Jesus is wanting to have with his bride in heaven. And so the, and there was in, uh, in the garden, there was apples to eat. Now they weren't, or not apples, there was a fruit on the tree and they weren't supposed to eat. There was eating before the fall. So I, I, the, to me, I would lean towards, and I kind of hope that there's food in, in heaven. Uh, in, in Revelation 19, 9, here's one again. This could be purely symbolic, but it says, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lamb. And when Jesus has the Lord's supper, He's like, I'm not going to participate in this meal again until we get to do it in heaven together. Now, I know the big question is, are there going to be calories in heaven? And no, those are from the devil. So I can, I can tell you definitively, no calories, all right? I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. Um, animals, animals. There were animals in the garden. That was part of Adam and Eve. Adam's job was to name the animals. And so we kind of see that before the fall, that there was animals there. Uh, in Isaiah eleven six 6 says, In that day the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. And so it kind of gives this picture. Again, it could be symbolic, but Isaiah is kind of pointing to this picture that, that um, animals might be present. We already know the, the animals with the eyes and the wings and something non-human is, is, is there. Now, I know you guys are like, now you're getting to the real stuff. I wanted to know about heaven. Is my pet Fluffy? Uh, you guys remember Fluffy from a couple weeks ago. Um, is my pet going to be in heaven? Again, I can't say definitively yes or no uh, or not, unless it's a cat, then I can, I can tell you, uh, no, they will not be in heaven. <laughs> uh, for personal, it will be personal. First Thessalonians uh, 4, 17 and 18, 
It talks about Jesus coming back, and it says, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together, notice that, caught up together, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so you get this idea that we are going to know one another. We are going to be together in heaven. Uh, Jesus, I, it's another passage for another time, but Jesus says, hey, I, I'm not going to be married to Rita. It's, it, it's, it's not a, uh, we're not going to be married in heaven. Uh, it's not even about that. Uh, but it seems to give the indication that we will know and recognize one another. I kind of have a feeling that we will know one another uh, on a more intimate level and, and have better connections and relationships in heaven than what we do uh, right now. So it's not like this is as good as it gets. I think it just gets even better in heaven when it comes to relationships. We also see a couple examples, like when Jesus has the transfiguration, all right, and they, they see Jesus and who he really is. Um, and also in that moment, uh, we see Moses and Abraham come, and they're recognized. They're recognized in that moment. So I got to think that it's a little bit personal. You're going you're gonna to know people and see them there. Fifth thing, and we've already touched on this, heaven is enjoyable. All right? There's not going to be any funeral directors in heaven. No grave diggers. No surgeons. No drug makers. No cancer researchers in heaven. All those things are gone forever. It says there's a, a new heaven and a, and a new earth. God is creating something brand new for what we're going to experience. Last Thanksgiving, uh, our family, we did a, a road trip out to Zion National Park. Anybody ever been to, to Zion National Park? Okay, some of us have. Right? I had never been. I was blown away with the beauty that was just, I was in awe of how amazing it was. And one of our quotes during that time was like, it's like Los Alamos, but on steroids. Like just, amazing. I believe when you get to heaven in this new, new earth, and this new heaven, you, you're, you're not going to be like, hey, you remember that Thanksgiving when we went to Zion? Wasn't that so amazing compared to what this is right there? No, I think in heaven you're going to be like, this is Zion on steroids. Like, just enjoyable. You are not going to get bored. You're not going to run out of things to do. You're going to absolutely love what's in store. Jesus said, hey, if you only knew, we talked about this last week, if you only knew how good it was in eternity, it's like a man who saw this hidden treasure in a field. So he went and sold everything he had so he could go buy that field. It's like if you knew how good it was, You'd sell and give up everything just to get a piece and a taste of what is in store for you in eternity. It's that good. Romans 8, 18, this isn't on your screen, says, what, yet what we suffer now is nothing, nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And that's not to dismiss your pain and suffering now. But he's saying, compared to heaven, come on, people. You got something way better. Sixth thing is it is, it is God-centered. Okay, we've talked about a lot of things that are kind of us-centered. I believe they will be there. But, but kid you not, the center of attention, the whole thing, all the glory is not going to us. It is going to God. In Revelation 21, it says this, the 12 gates were made of pearls. This is kind of describing this scene in heaven. I'm packing it a little bit more. It says, each gate from a single pearl. And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need for sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. Everything is centered in on God. The worship and the glory will be given to God in heaven. The nations will walk in its light. The kings will enter 
the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor to the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry or dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the one you want your name written in. The, the book of life. Seventh thing is, it is meaningful. Revelation 22 says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. And, clue this in right here, His servant will serve Him. I don't know exactly what we will be doing, but you will be doing something. You will be, it will be meaningful. The, the closest glimpse that I can explain, let's go back to the garden again, before the fall, before sin, or, sin entered. Adam had a job. God gave, they gave Adam and Eve a job in the garden to take care of it and tend it. And it was, it, we will have something. I don't know what, but we will have things to do. Luke 19 says this. Jesus tells a parable about a story about a king who went away. And while he was away, he told his servants, he gave them some money. And he said, I'm going to go away, invest this, and then I'm going to return. And so he went away. He came back. Two of the servants doubled it. One of them did nothing with it. And then Jesus kind of describes a little bit of what happens in that scene. And one of them, it says, after he was crowned king, he returned and called in his servants to whom he had given his, his, the money. He wanted to find out what the profits were. And so the first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king explained. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with a little I entrusted to you. So you will be governor of ten cities as your reward. Now this is a story, but Jesus is giving some sort of hint in eternity that you will have some sort of meaningful task. Your, your job, if you're doing it right, I, 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 in a way it's supposed to bring joy. It is fun when you're doing something that you enjoy that gives you passion, that you're like, wow, I really enjoy it. It's like, this is, this is good, this is healthy. Now, we pervert it, and we overwork, and we don't stop, and we don't rest. It's a story for another time. But I'm just saying work can be enjoyable, and I believe in heaven it will be, and it will be meaningful. Now, what can't we do in heaven? I want to switch the, the, that's some things that we can do. What can't we do in heaven? Number one, I can't pray prayers that shake the gates of hell. That's something you do right now in your midst. That's something you do right now while your flame is burning in these five seconds that you have here on earth compared to eternity. Jesus said when he started his church in Matthew 16, it says, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Nothing will stop the church. And I know we all have our church hurt stories where we've been wounded, but Jesus has not given up on his bride, the church. And it's not to dismiss the, the, the hurt, but I'm not giving up something that Jesus gave his life for. He died for his church, and he said, nothing will stop it. And so you have an opportunity to be a player in heaven right now. You might be thinking, well, my prayers aren't that great. My, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm the one. I mean, there's got to be somebody else. Pastor Mike, can you pray or whatever? And I'm like, I could pray, but so can you. You have access right now, today, to his throne, to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, Scripture says, that you can start praying prayers that shake the gates of hell. You will not have that opportunity in heaven. Why? Because hell will be locked away for eternity. It's done. By that time, it is done and over. When you get to heaven, I don't know if we will have, I, I seriously doubt we will have regret in heaven, but this is something that's been challenging me on all of these, okay? If these are things I can't do in heaven, which I don't believe they will be, then I ought to do them right now. And there's a part of me that thinks when it's clear in eternity, 
I'd be like, why didn't I do more of that? If I had only known, I would have totally done more of that. I'm trying to tell you today, as best as I can, do more of that. Because Jesus in his word is trying to tell you, this is what it's like in heaven. And once you're there, you cannot pray prayers that will shake the gates of hell. That time will be over. The second thing you can't do, you can't love Los Alamos in heaven. You can do that in your flame every day. You can love your neighbor. You can, you can serve the people around you. You can encourage the people around you. You can be generous instead of holding on to everything. You know, in Los Alamos, we don't, we, there is poverty of, with finances. There is. But the, one of the greatest poverties in Los Alamos is not financial. It is relational. I promise you, if you went across your row right now, somebody's lonely. Somebody is, is, is looking for a friend. You don't have to go far to find relational poverty in Los Alamos, and you can love Los Alamos today. Nobody's stopping you. That's free of charge. You won't have that opportunity to love the lost, to, to serve the needy in heaven, because that will be done. Je That's why Jesus came. When Jesus came to earth, God in human flesh came to earth. He came to serve. He says, if you're going to roll with me, then we're, we're going we're to help those who've been rolled over by life. And we're going to do as much of that as we can while we can. You want to be my follower? Let's go see the need. Let's go help people. That you cannot do in heaven. Third thing, you can't share the gospel and see someone put their faith in Jesus in heaven. Have you ever, has anyone ever been there when someone said yes? Like you were in that moment where they're like, hey, I want, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. Has anybody ever been a part of that? I'm, we, I, I, want to, I want to step on your toes a little bit. We should all say yes to that. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's one of, it's one of the mandates. Go and make disciples. Seek and save those who are lost. I want you to have that opportunity where, where, you, where you see somebody who wants to say yes. This is, this is 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You, you are an ambassador of Jesus here on planet Earth as though God were making his appeal through us. It's like God speaking through you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message. All of us who claim to be a follower of Jesus, you are his ambassador. Your life is telling a story. I want this for you. Like, what else on your resume when, you, when the king comes back and you want to show what, what you've done with that, that, that resource that he gave you, what else is going to top off on your resume that says, man, I helped lead my neighbor to Jesus. I help, I help a coworker told them about Jesus and shared about the love of Jesus, and then they said yes. I, I, there's not going to be much that, that hits on top of that. It's one of the main reasons. We're here to exist, to glorify God. But as an ambassador of Jesus, we carry that message. I would hope at some point in your life, through the relationships that you have and you're living this thing out, that somebody would say, you know what? I don't know what it is about you. But I want to know what's different about you. To which you say, Jesus. Oh, well, then I want that. How do I get that? Oh, you want to know? You want him to be the, 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 the boss of your life and forgive you of your sins? Yeah, I, I, I want that. You mean like right now? Yeah, I want I want to do that right now. Okay. How do we do that? Well, let's, 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 let's pray. Let's talk to God. Let's, let's just tell him what's on your heart. Ask him to forgive you for your sins and, and go. Okay, cool. Let's do it right now. Let's go.
I want that moment for you. I remember the first time it happened to me, I was on a, on a youth group trip. We went to an event where there was a, a speaker. He gave the gospel invitation, and, and he asked any teenager that wanted to give their life to Christ, hey, right there. And they said, if you want to give it, we've got some people that will just counsel with you, talk with you, pray with you, just whatever you need in this moment, we're right here. And I'm here, and then all these kids start coming, and this one kid comes right over to me, and so I'm like, okay. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And, and he's like, I want to give my life to Jesus. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, no, what do I do? And so we just prayed. It's like, let's just talk to God. You don't have to know all the stuff. You just be with somebody and talk to them. And it was one of the most beautiful moments. Now, if you're feeling a little bit guilty about it, you're like, I don't know. You can do that today. You can share your faith today. Nobody's stopping you. One of the most beautiful places to do it would be in, 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 in the kids' area. How many of you, just by show of hands, you gave your life to Jesus uh, at the age uh, 18 or lower. Look around. Look around. Keep them up. Keep your hands up. 18 or younger. You, okay. All right. <clears throat> I mean, we got to understand that God does something in those teenage years, and the enemy also does something in those teenage years and younger years to try to move them in a path to where they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or whatever, and by that time, we don't change or do anything, do we? So I'm just, it's important. If you want to go serve in Freedom Kids, you might help see somebody's life change for eternity just in our kids' environment or working with teenagers in that moment. You cannot share the gospel and see someone put their faith in Jesus in heaven. Fourth thing, you can't choose obedience. Now, I have this irrational fear when we get to heaven that I'm going to be the one to screw it up. We're going to get in there, and somehow there's going to be this fork in the road, and I'm going to be like, I know me. I don't trust me. I'm going to sin in heaven. I'm going to be the one and ruin it for all y'all. And then I, the way Scripture describes it is you won't have the choice. Satan won't be there to deceive. There is no sin in heaven. So you won't have that choice. Your choice to obey happens on this side of eternity. Today's choice, when we challenge you every week, take your next step of faith. I believe everybody in here, no matter who you are, how bad you've screwed it up, God has a next step of faith for you. I want you to do that. And when we all are obedient to that, I believe God's going to move. He's going to give you a next step. And that's how we go love Los Alamos and change the world right there. It's just being by obedient. Well, you only have that opportunity right now. I realize some of you guys today, too, like just to give yourself a pat on the back, you didn't feel like coming to church today. You woke up and like, eh, eh, my body's aching or there's football on or whatever. I get it. I don't always feel like coming, too. But, and I'm the pastor, but you made a choice. You said, this, this thing today, I am going to set aside a time to worship my Creator. I may not feel like it, but I'm going to make a choice to say, you know what? I am investing in me. I am investing in my relationship with God. I am worshiping Him today. You won't always feel it, but you, always, you won't always have the choice. In heaven, you can't choose obedience. Fifth thing, you can't leverage your resources for eternal causes. There's not going to be a generosity moment in heaven. There's not going to be a giving moment in heaven. That is done on, on this side of eternity. Jesus said, store your treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires of your heart will also be. He's saying, your, and it's not just financial, but your, your level of being a generous person, that happens here. And he says, that stores up something in heaven better than anything you can imagine here on earth. And what do we naturally do? We want to hoard and, and store up here on planet Earth. We talked about that last week. In his sermon, Louis tells a story about how he went to a party, a birthday party for a friend. And at this party, his, as they were heading to the party, and it was kind of this, it was a small gathering, but kind of one of those those. Uh, you know, like a, a, a 40 or 50 or 60, a big birthday party type stuff. They said, as they're driving there, did you bring the gift? No, I thought you were getting the gift. I don't have the gift. 
They forgot the gift. And so they ended up getting a gift just real quick on the way to the party for a close friend of theirs. They get there, they see the little gift table, they put their gifts on there, but they're also like, this was not the gift we wanted to bring to our friend on his special birthday party. And Louis goes on to tell, as the night went on and they're sharing stories or whatever, that, that, that gift that they bought and it's, it's just sitting there at the gift table is kind of just stirring within them. And he kind of looks at these other gifts and realizes, man, these are really nice gifts. And the one we got is just not the one that we wanted. So he went and he took his gift and hit it and said, we will bring you and send you the gift we really wanted to give at a later time because I'm not going to give you that gift. In heaven, there will be no redos. The gift you bring to the party, that's the one you got. And again, I don't know that regret will be there in heaven, but I got to think when it's all clear, a lot of us would be asking, why didn't I bring a better gift? If I only knew, I would have brought something and planned way better. And Jesus is saying, I've written it out for you plain as day. What you do now matters in eternity. You're not bringing your stuff on planet Earth with you to heaven, but when you give and when you serve and when you obey and you share your faith, Jesus says you are storing up a treasure in heaven that's beyond anything you can imagine. And he couldn't be more clear about it. Sixth thing you can't do is you cannot face persecution in heaven for the sake of Jesus. This is not the kind of persecution that we are, 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 are typical in, in, uh, in our Western United States culture, okay? Reed and I, we work for the Gideons over the summer, which is a, a Christian organization that puts Bibles in, in uh, hotel rooms, and we went and did a conference there. And there's thousands of Gideons all in, this, in the city. We're working with college students. It's a lot of fun. And they give you T-shirts. If you're on staff or you're a volunteer there, they give you these T-shirts. It's got the verse on it and stuff like that. And we're all like... We're like, we get to wear a Christian shirt with verses and stuff. I don't know if you're like me, but living in Los Alamos, if I'm going to wear a big flamboyant church shirt out, I'm like, I'm probably going to get some stares at Smith's or something like, what is this or whatever? And everybody at this convention is just wearing them and excited. We're like, oh my gosh, look how freeing this is. I don't have to feel like I need to defend my faith if I go to Smith's and wear a Christian t-shirt. I'm, you can do whatever you want, but that's just me, all right? That's not persecution. All right, persecution is like in North Korea, where if they catch you with a Bible, you're going to go to jail or you're going to be executed. If they catch you sharing your faith, you're going to go to jail or you're going to be executed. There's a story of a lady in, in our modern times. Her, her name is, is changed just for her identity's sake. She was from North Korea, and she escaped North Korea into China. Only the Chinese government and officials found her, arrested her, and sent her back to North Korea to where she was put in prison with a three-year prison term. I don't know when this lady became a Christian, but she, either in the prison or outside, she already was. But in three years in this prison, it was uh, described as a jail cell with just like hell. It, there was, it was made for maybe 50 people at most. There was 100 in there. And it, it crammed into this one cell for three years. If you woke up in the middle of the night and you had to go to the bathroom or something like that, you've lost your spot on the floor and you had to stand and the conditions are just horrible. She's a Christian in there. You can't speak out about Christianity because if they hear it, you're dead. But she decided that she had the nudge to share her faith with people. And what she ended up doing was she would find moments near the toilet, because the toilet was, the conditions were so horrible that people were not hanging out around the toilet. And so she could find these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And in, in the span of this three years, this woman tells her story where, where someone got saved. And then over a little bit of another time, another prisoner gave their life to Christ. And then they would have church service around the toilet. 
just a handful of them, people giving their life to Christ in this horrible, horrible prison of a situation. And they had to be quiet because if anyone found out, they were dead. That's persecution. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for great, a great reward awaits you in heaven. Now, this isn't a license to go be a jerk, all right, because I see too much of that, but this will not happen in heaven. We say these things when we think about heaven. Oh, I can't wait to meet Peter. I can't wait to meet Peter in heaven and just, you know, ask him about all those things that he said and, and did and, and get to learn from him. And we get to find out about Peter, you know, did, did, he, did he really die by crucifixion? To which if Peter's talking, he'd say, yeah. And they, not only did I die by crucifixion, but I had them crucify me upside down because I did not find it worthy, myself worthy enough to die in the exact same manner that Jesus did. They crucified him upside down, tradition says, for his faith in Jesus. I can't wait to meet Paul. He's like the Tom Brady of the New Testament. Like the, the dude just, I mean, he wrote theologically just all these amazing things, what we learn about and these glimpses into heaven. And, and, and I, can't, I can't wait to have a conversation to him, with him. And Paul would say, hey, man, yeah, I went on these mission trips and had these conversations and these miracles and these healings and these things, they, they happened. Tell me about yours. What happened in your tiny flame? In your five seconds. Oh, you just sat on a porch and read about my mission. You drank you drink coffee and, and, and read about all the things that God was doing in and through me. See, I wrote about those hoping they would inspire your journey. See, we're not going to get a taste of that in heaven. If we're going to do those things, they happen now. We have an opportunity now to impact forever when we walk out of these doors, to live with a healthy urgency, to live with purpose, to see lives changed, to see your friends forever changed in the name of Jesus. A bonus thing that you cannot do in heaven is you can't say yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior in heaven. By that time, the box score will already be posted. You have to do that in your five seconds. For some of us in the room, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're, you're, you're going to get to that moment. And I know you're already kind of triggered and you're like, oh, you're trying to rationalize or whatever. And you're going to be standing in front of the throne saying, why? Didn't I say yes? I even went to church on that day when that short, balding pastor was even talking about it. I even showed up online and I watched it and I listened and I tried to just say, no, another time, I have more time, I, I just can't do it or whatever. And by that time, it's too late. Peter, Jesus' best friend, says, you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. We're like, come on, Jesus, come on now. Jesus, anytime, please come back. Our world is a dumpster fire right now. Come on. Uh-uh. No. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Okay? This is huge. God's not being slow. He just loves humanity. He's giving them every opportunity to say yes. But the day, don't miss this, the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. It's happening. I mentioned the lightning strike a couple weeks, or last week. Last Sunday afternoon, I went to go play pickleball. It happened again. <laughs> you don't know that you have tomorrow. You don't know how much time you have. I'm done with the lightning strikes, God. 
Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in a fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Listen. Satan wants you to get tripped up on the lie. Well, how could God, how could a good God send people to hell? How could he send them to hell for eternity? Listen, he's not sending people to hell. Your sin sends you to hell. The world's already condemned. The world's already, already judged. He wants, he's not want anybody to perish, but what all to have a relationship with him. I want you to see, not this question about how could, how could God send someone to hell for eternity. I want you to see that God came to earth, flesh and blood, to try to make it clear God loves everybody. You have two outcomes when it comes to this moment standing before God. One life with God forever, one separated with God forever, described as hell. And he said, in the middle of it, I give you a gift called salvation. You just have to receive it. And he came with his own flesh and blood, saying, anybody, anybody who wants their name written in the book of life? Oh, I'll write it. So take the gift. Receive the gift. You don't have to work to earn it. You just open it. How do I open it? Believe. Jesus is God. He died on the cross for your sins. You know what? You know what? You're not perfect. You know, someone's not in here going, you know what, Mike? Um, I don't know about everybody else, but perfect. No. Jesus paid the price for that. You don't have to work to earn it. He says, you believe in me? Confess your sins? Confess me as Lord and Savior? I'll just read it to you because this makes it more clear. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will, not might, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and openly declaring your faith that you are saved. God choose, chose you. He accepts you. He receives you. If you want your name in that book of life, you could have it today. So with that, I'm going to ask that we would stand, and I want to pray. We're going to nail some things down. I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the message today. I hope you felt inspired to take your next step of faith with Jesus. Just a couple next steps that you can take coming out of this. One, leave a review or a comment or share this message. That really does spread the message further and faster when you do that. Secondly, if there's a next step that you need to take coming out of this, head on over to our website, click get involved and let us know exactly how you can take your next step. We would love to partner with you in that. And finally, if you have been impacted in a positive way through our ministries or your family has been impacted in a positive way through our ministries, go on over to our website and click give. And if you want to partner with us financially, that would be huge in getting the message of Jesus out through our ministries. Thank you again for stopping by the podcast. Have a wonderful week. God bless.